So we are speaking on part two, triggered number two, dealing with anxiety, something that none of us are able to dodge. It's a reality to each and every one of us. So did you know that anxiety and fear does have a proper place? Did you know that? Okay. Do you want to know where? So I really wished, I love visual aid and stuff like that, and I wish I'd managed to get this. Uh, my daughter has this beautiful candle of these like clay hands. They go like this and then the candle's inside it. And it's so aesthetic. It's so Insta-worthy, you know. And I wished I'd asked her. I kept thinking about it so I could have them here as a representation and a picture for you to see. But anxiety and fear's proper place is in the hands of God. That is where its end point is. So imagine, okay, let me just do this quickly. I had to fill up bags with all sorts of stuff and there we go, this one came from there. All right, so imagine we were to take stock and be cognizant every single day of how much fearful and anxious thoughts that we have that are triggered by circumstances and situations. Imagine we were to take stock of that, of how much we end up holding onto by the end of the day, instead of immediately giving it back to God. It would look something like this, okay? The electricity bill that goes off every month and yet still keeps accumulating on their, their side. My child's education, who's got children that are being educated, something to think about, okay? Is that mole in my back getting bigger? Because it's certainly getting itchy, okay? All right, okay. Car service. Oh my goodness, the car that, oh, that's heavy, my word. <laughs> the car that needs to get serviced, okay? And I'm sure it's leaking water because I keep on having to fill up the water, okay? All right, uh, what's this? The food that I forgot to defrost before I left the house this morning, which was meant to be for dinner tonight. Okay, so this is what it kind of looks like. So your day is like this. So you're cruising around your whole day carrying this, okay? So this is what you arrive at work with. This is what you drag around, all the baggage that you have through your day, okay? And then you arrive home, okay? And your dear, sweet, blessed husband says to you, love, what's for dinner? Boom! The item that wasn't defrosted when I left the house this morning. That's what was for dinner. Or your kid comes through and goes, I'm hungry. And immediately, that's your trigger and you end up popping. And that's your popping point of all the stuff that you've been carrying and then you just suddenly explode. Okay? Let's extrapolate it the other way around. Okay? So imagine we're carrying all that and suddenly you get a simple question asked. So that was the build up. Love, should we go to the beachfront this afternoon? Do you not know that petrol has increased by how much, how much per litre? What, what, what? I have a tender that needs to be in by Tuesday morning. I've got a headache because I didn't sleep correctly. I don't know what's happening about the kids' education. I've got a meeting that I don't feel prepared for on Wednesday. <clears throat> no, I don't want to go to beachfront. So you end up popping for something that's illegitimate and not actually worth getting frustrated about, okay? So today, I'm hoping that both you and I will be encouraged by learning that it is possible to live free from fear and anxiety. What will this cause? What will the result be of this? Okay, it will make us aware of our responses to difficult, adverse, pressurizing situations for us to be able to then adjust 
as needed to have a more faithful, gracious, pleasant response so that we don't react. You know, when we respond to something, that's pleasant. When we react to something, it's like being radioactive. I mean, what is radio? It's just, bleh. it's just death. It's just horrible. But the bottom baseline is that we wouldn't get triggered. We wouldn't pop. Think about road rage. What is road rage? It's an accumulation and escalation of situation that has happened through your morning. So you go to hug the baby goodbye and they spit up on your shirt. You have to go and change your shirt to one that you didn't want to wear because that was one that you want to wear but it's got spit up all over it. You go to walk out the back door, you stand in the dog poop. You have to go rinse your, your shoe off now, your, the bank, bottom of your pants are wet. Go to the car, oh, it needs water. Go to open the boot, you get grease on your hands. Now you're starting to run late for work. Now you get into traffic and someone cuts you off. Off. And it's like, no! Ah! See that accumulation of escalation of frustration. If you'd walked out and everything was as it should be, and you'd had your breakfast and you'd walk to the car, oh, it's such a beautiful day today. There's a bit of a chill in the air. I think summer's almost over. And you're driving down the road, and you know, oh, and then someone cuts you off. Oh, bless them, Lord. <laughs> Father, I pray that you would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation on how to drive correctly. Father, I pray that you would protect them, that they wouldn't have a, a, an accident in their day, but you would just protect them, be with them. Is that a bird I hear chirping? You see, what I, you see what, where it is, okay. So last week, Craig spoke about unhealthy and healthy fear or anxiety and the importance of recognizing the difference because there are two types, a healthy fear and an unhealthy fear. And then, knowing the difference so we can respond appropriately. So we learned that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us a spirit of power, love, and of self-discipline. Some translations say a sound mind. So today, what we're gonna do is we are going to learn how to correctly respond not to healthy fear, but to unhealthy fear, by putting fear and anxiety in its proper place, in God's hands. So bear in mind, if God has not given us a spirit of fear, so then being fearful or living in a fearful, anxious state with no apparent threat or reason therefore means that it is illegitimate, okay? Which therefore means we need to actually take authority over that thing. You know, like you see someone worrying about something, you're like, it's not really that big a deal. Like, you don't really have to be worrying about that, you know? And, but you can't get inside their head, or, or you, they can't get inside your head if they're going, it's not that big a deal. So we have to take authority because sometimes it can be a delusional fear. You see, the enemy wants to inflict that upon us because he wants to rob uh, everything. He comes to rob, kill, and destroy. He wants, to, and that'll include our peace, joy, hope, everything. So we need to figure out if that's perhaps an unnecessary thing and if it's illegitimate. Okay, so when I was younger, I used to have this fear of dogs. Ask my parents. It was ludicrous. Like, I, I literally shook from the inside out if there was a dog in a, a like one kilometer radius of me. Okay, so we were, I was petrified, but it was completely and utterly irrational. So my parents would phone the place that we were going to for the bra and say, hi, sorry, we're bringing Dawn with us. Would you mind locking your dog away? I mean, a dog owners, me, you know your dog. Would you mind locking your dog away? Oh, no, no, don't worry. Snoopy won't hurt a fly. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. You take your Snoopy and all the flies that he won't hurt and you go and put them behind a closed door because I tell you what, I will shred the upholstery in the car before I get out and face that four-legged barking thing. I tell you, it didn't matter if it was a Rottweiler with dagger sharp teeth or a poodle. I was, I'd literally crawl up and perch myself on my dad's head we now own three dogs, go figure, okay. But you know, I used to have prayer sessions with you know, perfect love casts out all fear, you know, and, and that prayer over me and stuff like that. There is no fear in love, 
because I was so fearful of it, but it was an irrational, irrational, illogical fear. So many of us, fear and anxiety have been a default response to trouble, whether it's big or small. A puncture on the car or the fact that our son lost his one photostatic page that he was meant to hand in the school. And we end up trying to react to it in the same way of escalation, okay? Because it's become like a behavior pattern. We've learned to live on the verge and the edge of flight or flight, flight or fight. Like, ready, okay? And anything triggers a reaction. And sometimes it's irrational and then we pop. We could even say that maybe it's become habitual behavior for some of us. But here's a good thing, is that a habit, if it is formed, can be broken, especially by the power of Jesus. And we can develop new habits in place of the old habits. So we've got to understand, you see, there might be a whole lot of stuff, but then standing in the dog poop outside the back door could just be the tipping point. You think about this. It could even be a physiological manifestation. So not just necessarily being nasty and sharp with those who you love around you and being bleh, but actually something inside, maybe there's an ulcer, tension, tension headaches, knots in your shoulders, a physiological manifestation. Do you think that God, that Jesus died on the cross for that? No, he died on the cross for that stuff to be there with him and not on our shoulders. So Paul ends the book of Philippians with this. Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about the bills at the end of the month. No, 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 no. Don't be anxious about anything, nothing. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God with thanksgiving. Key word there, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. So here's understanding, it transcends that. So we can't fathom it, we can't get our heads around it. Will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Imagine the gods of Buckingham Palace. They have got something to guard. This is God Almighty guarding our hearts and our minds, not just a fragile, futile person. This is God Himself. So imagine living a life that was completely and utterly free of fear and anxiety. I'm using the words interchangeably, fear, anxiety, all of those together, worry. So it almost sounds too good to be true. So, so Paul almost sounds delusional or idealistic by saying, do not be anxious about anything. Okay, you see, so no, no, Paul, you didn't, you, don't live in, you, you didn't live in this day and age. It's very different for you, okay? Because um, uh, you've never been in rush hour traffic. You didn't even own a car that sometimes gets a puncture and runs out of water, okay? You have never had a bond to pay. Um, you didn't grow up in a generation with social media, okay? Um, medical aid, you've never had to deal with that. You've never had your credit card hacked, all right? He wasn't married, he didn't have to tend for a spouse. He wasn't raising a teenager or two, or as I say about the Haywoods, 10, you know? So he he was outside of that. He doesn't have any idea of how difficult it is today. Okay, listen to how challenging this is. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24 to 28. This is Paul just doing a little bit of, just doing a little bit of a backdrop on, on stuff. Five times, I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That's 39 if you were guessing. Three times I was beaten with rods. Anyone been beaten? No, don't answer it. Three times beaten. Once I was pelted with stones. I mean, the most we've had is our car pelted with like hail. And then we have the insurance issue to deal with. His body was pelted with not just ice, but stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Imagine that for bobbing around. I have been constantly on the move. He can relate to mothers of toddlers, okay? I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews. You'd imagine they'd be on his side. 
He's in danger from them, in danger from Gentiles, in danger from the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. Again, moms of tots, he can relate. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, let me just insert here, in this recounting of everything he's been through, he doesn't even mention the times that he was in prison and being held captive. To be quite honest, I think that when he was in prison, it was actually quite a nice breather for him because someone wasn't beating him up and he wasn't you know, exposed to the elements. So it was actually probably a time that he could regroup and just be with God. No wonder he worshiped in the, in, in, in the, the jail and the doors opened. But he says, besides everything else, and he equates this to almost as much pressure as all of that that he's been, has been inflicted upon him. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. His prize was the gospel of Jesus being preached, this magnificent and marvelous message of life and liberty. He equates that is one of the things that he bears as a as a pressure, as a burden, because it's of such importance. You see, so in seeing all of this, we can see that he had his fair share of trials and tribulations, okay? Actually, he had more than most. In fact, I think that he had more than any of us sitting in this room. In fact, I think all of us put together would not quantify to what he'd experienced. So he had legitimate situations where he had to overcome fear and anxiety. In light of all of this, he goes on to say in verse 11 of Philippians 4, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. He was meaning there in having a lot and also having a little, having so little that you're actually naked. So what was his secret? I believe that he knew and he had mastered the art of our big point number one, giving it all to God. Giving it all to God. This is what he'd mastered. This was a part of his secret. Because we want to know his secret, because he's a champion. Okay? But it sounds so simplistic. It's like it's just too simple. It's like it sounds so Christian. It's like Christianese, like give it all to God, you know? No, you don't understand. Don't you think that the answer should be more complicated, you know, for such a complex and destructive problem? Friends, he wouldn't say it if it weren't possible. He would not say it if it weren't possible. Paul learned about fear and anxiety and worry and the fact that they belong in the hands of God, not in our hands. Come on, we live in a hands-free generation. I've got my Bluetooth, everything, hands-free, hands-free, my coffee's made for me, everything. Meantime, we live in a hands-free generation, but we're always filling our hands up with the wrong things and carrying all this nonsense around that we actually don't need to have. So here's another clue and key for us inside the secret. Gratitude-laced prayers. In every circumstance and situation that we find ourselves, whether big or small, gratitude laced prayers. So, okay, it's not that fear and anxiety and worry don't exist. They do. They do. But they have to have their proper place. The challenge for us is that we need to develop the habit of discerning it and where to place those troublesome situations and circumstances in his hands, not ours. So I wanna tell you a story about the dump. If you live on the bluff, you would know the inconvenience of the fact that the dump's gates have been closed for the past, I don't know, week and a half or something, okay? So we were just accumulating stuff in our workhorse, our bucky, we were just jamming foliage, rubbish, recycle, everything, and was just packing up and stacking up, okay? So we had junk in our trunk that needed to be dumped, okay? So 
I was sending a voice note to someone. They were very brave. They, it's a highly courageous message they'd sent me, really stepping out of the boat, wanting to shake up and shift their status quo because they were starting to experience popping points, triggers, why they're so frustrated with their kids, why there's such a short tension that they feel like they're living in, okay? So I'm responding to that message. I've just arrived at somebody's house. I'm in their garden. I'm about to meet with them, and I'm in the truck, and I'm sitting, and I'm sending a quick voice note. And as I'm talking, I look in the rearview mirror and remember all this junk in the trunk, and I say, you know what? Prophetically, I just want to start saying this. You know, I understand about baggage, because that's what they feel, that there's baggage that they're carrying, which is inhibiting them to move into their future. Who else feels like that? It's real, okay? So there's this baggage in the back, and they, and they can't move forward. So I start speaking prophetically about this, this rubbish and this foliage and this junk, and I say, it's stacked up here, but here's the problem. The dump doors are closed. I can't get in there. Every morning I'm driving past and going, is it open today? No, it's still shut, and it's just accumulating, getting heavier and heavier, So what's gonna happen? But here's the thing, spiritually, Christ cut a path to the cross for us and those gates will never be closed. So the baggage and the the stuff and the junk of our lives, the things, the pressures that we can't deal with, we can go there and we can put it at the foot of the cross. Those gates are never ever closed. So anyway, I finish up that voice note. I go in and I start visiting with a person whose garden I was in. Somehow the conversation comes up where she goes about, oh, and the dump, you know, the fact that the dump stores are closed. She'd actually put some stuff in her car to go and drop it off, but then it was closed. But she came home and she wasn't able to take the junk out the trunk because, you know, and she just hadn't done it that night. And the next morning she woke up and her whole car was filled with condensation because of the foliage and the rubbish inside her car. And I said, no ways. I can't believe we're having this chat, like literally in your garden. I was voice noting someone and talking to them about the dump and the inconvenience of it and the fact that we can go to Jesus and nothing gets bagged up inside the, in here because this is where we keep it. We don't get any condensation in here. Man, that stuff smells. If you leave it for long enough, it starts to smell. It goes off. But the cross is always open. You'll be glad to know that the dump did open. I think it was on Thursday. Get there fast. They're taking down your number plates. Quickly, dump and go. (laughs) Number two, big point number two, make your requests known. God is not surprised by the way that you feel. He formed you and knit you together in your mother's womb, okay? And he knows every hair on your head. He doesn't think that your irrational fear of clowns or dogs when you were little was silly. He also doesn't think that the fact that maybe you're a little bit fearful about one day getting sick into the future doesn't concern him. It doesn't, it doesn't undermine him, it doesn't surprise him, it doesn't shock him. He's there for us. Perhaps your concern about your child's education and their future. He doesn't look at it with disdain and he, doesn't, he certainly doesn't think that you've got less faith than anyone else because you have these niggles and these concerns. They're real. They are real. But he wants to hear from you so that he can partner with you and he can intervene in those situations and take it off our hands. So Paul says, in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So prayer and a request enveloped with thanksgiving might sound like this, okay? I'm gonna give you three examples, fill in the gaps, You've probably got your own points and topics that you could put in here. But listen to this. Number one, thank you, Lord, for the home that we have. Thank you for providing shelter, warmth, and protection from the sun and rain, a place that we can go to that is called home. I don't know how we're going to pay the bond this week, this month, but I know you do. Please calm our hearts and guide our steps and let your radical hand of provision be made manifest in this situation. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. So there's been thankfulness. You've presented the prayer and the petition, and then you've stepped back. Also, saying about how capable he is. Number two, thank you, Lord, for my dad. I love how hard he works and how every Saturday morning he brings donuts back for us. He's been drinking again, Lord. And I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen. And sometimes he gets really angry. Please help him, Lord. And please keep us safe tonight. Please break in and release him from the cyclical addiction that he seems to be bound in that affects us all so badly because you are the one that can break the chains of addiction. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's thanksgiving. It's enveloped, it's laced with thanksgiving, prayer and petition into the ever-capable hands of God. Third example, just to give you some ideas. Thank you, Lord, for the 70 years you've given me. I could spend days recounting the endless blessings and grace you've poured over this life. I am completely humbled by your faithfulness. I received a cancer diagnosis yesterday. I know you aren't surprised to hear that. I need to say, friends, God does not inflict sickness or disease. He doesn't take away our loved ones. He doesn't make people die. He wouldn't be a good God. We live in a fallen state, in a fallen world, and that is the reason why we sometimes have to face these things. God is not the one that inflicts that, okay? So I know that you aren't surprised to hear this, but I'm so scared. I am terrified to start chemo. I'm terrified to tell the kids I don't know who will organize the house or do Christmas if I'm not around. I need to know that you are here with me. I need to know that this will all be okay one way or the other. And I need to know that if I'm gone, that someone will be here to help my husband eat three healthy meals a day. Thank you for healing, for hearing me. Thank you for healing me because by your stripes, I am healed. And I thank you that you're going to surround me and my family through the season in Jesus' name. Amen. So obviously these prayers won't be the same ones that you'd pray, but you get the idea. We present our requests with thanksgiving. And when we are faithful to put our fear and anxiety in its proper place, in God's hands, at the foot of the cross, you know what we can expect? Big point number three. We can expect peace. Point number three, expect peace. So as we pray through the fear and the trouble and the adversity, we can simultaneously hold the expectation that God will come through. I can't logically explain it, a peace that transcends understanding, but I can tell you, and I believe it, that it's possible, and when it happens, it's amazing. I mean, we, I, I remember the early days of when we first planted Grace Life, 14 years ago in May, it'll be 14 years. So much excitement, but so much, ugh, it was like, Lord, you gotta break in, you gotta provide, you know? You gotta be made manifest, you gotta prove yourself in this thing, and He would. So we'd present our prayers, with such excitement and thanksgiving because we were so excited with the journey that he was taking us on. But with this almost like mm, fear and intrepidation, but massive expectation. I tell you, time after time after time, he didn't just meet our needs, he superseded our needs. He's been magnificent. Look at this place. This is all by the hand of God. I tell you, he has proved himself over and over again because he's that faithful. He goes above and beyond. We can only do that much. He can do the unimaginable. So a peace that transcends all understanding. So I had a very dear friend, her name was Farah. We went through all the different chapters of life. We were at school together, so school girls. Then we jawled together. We had those crazy, just wild days of drugs and parties and all of that. And then she went overseas to England. And I got saved in 2001. And her, she came back, her and her boyfriend, they came back and 
I'd been radically saved. All I could talk about was Jesus. And she couldn't get around this thing of fear of death. Okay, she had two fears, geckos and death. She was petrified of dying. I, I, I remember the one day I took her into town. We had a, a, a job there. I was working for my dad, sat right in the center of town. And we went there and she was petrified because she was so fearful of death. Anyway, fast forward about 15 years and uh, she was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer. And uh, I remember her saying to me the one night, they lived in, they'd moved to Dubai and then they lived in Australia. At the time of her diagnosis, they were living in Australia, they'd planted a church, but they were here on a trip, it was her last trip here. And she said to me, I-, I can't imagine not being there for my daughter's wedding. I couldn't even get that in my grid. I couldn't even imagine that. But she said, I might not be there for my daughter's wedding. Her daughter was eight years old at the time. Two years later, she ended up passing away. Her daughter was 10. I tell you what, at the tail end of that time, she just wrote oracles. She put it out there. A a person who was petrified of fear in their unsaved state came into a revelation of God, got saved, and she would just take that time. She would say, man, if you've got an issue with someone, go sort it out. Come on, this life is short. Make right and try banoffee because it's jolly tasty as well. Okay, she would just write these, these faithful directions and instructions. She used Facebook as her platform. She died courageous. She faced death with valor. Do you know what her parting scripture was? She repeated what Paul said. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. What a turnaround of someone who was scared of death. She saw it as her gain. That's Philippians 1 verse 21. See, what's our greatest fear? That is our biggest fear. And if we start to extrapolate from that and we're not fearful of that, then we can't be fearful of, of you know, the puncture. We got to get unhealthy fear in its right perspective and put it in its right grid so it doesn't trigger us and pop us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 54 says, when the perishable, this, has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So later in Philippians, after Paul has learned the secret to being content in every situation, he then goes on to say, I can do everything through Christ who gives, through him who gives me strength. Philippians 4 verse 13. So Paul knows what we need to know, that in the hands of God, through the power of Christ, anything is possible. So I know that there are some of you, even me, facing impossible situations, okay? Maybe terrible, terrifying medical diagnoses or, or adversity or trials or relational issues. So in order to live a life free of fear and anxiety almost seems completely ludicrous. But I wanna implore you with everything within me to partner with me and let's let this week be a week where we try and commit ourselves to developing a more faith-filled response when faced with fear and anxiety in every situation and circumstance. Let's start to form new habits. Let's get a new learned behavior, a new default, a new knee-jerk reaction when these things seem to be trying to overwhelm us. By number one, giving it all to God and letting it go, dumping our fear and our anxiety and our worry. Number two, making our requests known, cased in thanksgiving. Allow these things of anxiety to become triggers to us, 
to say these thanksgiving coated prayers and petitions. And then number three, expecting a divine peace that transcends all understanding. So even if we have to do it audibly during the day, okay, we don't want to be weird, we don't want to freak out the people around us, but if you can, we might even have to do it audibly, where we start to see something trying to encroach on our peace and get up in our grill and and upset us, and we start to feel that thing pressure. No, 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 no. We identify what it is, we we present our thankfulness for it, present it to God and leave it in His ever-capable hands. See, the thing is, and we can trust that these small steps will lead to big breakthroughs in our lives. There is so much unhealthy fear around us, and legitimately so. So now, as this time, as believers, all the more we have to recognize it, respond to it, not react, and start to put it in its proper place in the almighty, ever capable hands of our Father who is sitting on His throne like this. Give it to me, my child. Can you imagine how it grieves Him when He sees us carrying around all our baggage, getting worn down and then reacting to the ones and being radioactive to the ones that we love. Why don't you join me in standing?